Hi, this is Lips. And this is Rob Reiner. We're from the band Anvil. You are listening to Sick Room with Collab. You know it. We have Anvil here on the Sick Room uh, for a very special occasion. Thanks for joining on, joining me on the show, guys. How does it feel that uh, you've reached an audience as far, as far as New Zealand? Incredible, man. We're fucking psyched up, man. We love Australia. Listen, we love it down there. We've been to Australia. We've toured there. And uh, the people... Oh, it's like it's like coming to Canada. It's, it's, it's very, very similar, similar to uh, Canada. Home. Believe it or not, we're about opportunity, and you know, and well, we love to play for for the fans that love the band. So I mean, we have them all over the world. So any opportunity to go there is is worth going. We we work for everybody. There, are, we don't we don't make ridiculous demands or. We heard about some of the crazy shit, you know. You know, the, uh, it, it's interesting um, it, that now that you're talking, you asked about that in the sense that when we did come to Australia, there were bands that came with full-on crews, like a complete crew, and and one of the bands not only did they bring a crew, but they brought a big screen TV from America. I think that was pretty ridiculous. I mean, to, so that they could play Xbox 360, they're bringing a big screen TV overseas. Like, what are they doing? You know, as and demanding that they have it there. It's like, I, I think that that's pretty outrageous. I mean, I haven't heard of anything much more outrageous than that, but you know, I don't know. Every band is, you know, that has, I guess their own quirks, get, get famous enough and, you know, you, problems <laughs> so what what's the worst part of the job being an anvil have you got a have you got a particular thing you don't like about being in the band at all or? oh yeah I, I absolutely do having time sitting around and not rocking uh, i suppose uh, uh, rob that's why we see you quite a lot on facebook so you can interact with your fans is it because you have that much time on your hands well i'm always in touch with the uh, public as much as i can you know but uh, I love to tour and play in front of people. Unfortunately, you can't do it all the time, but I'm, I'm one of those type of people that could do it all the time. Um, just, they don't allow you to, so it's... And I'm not, I'm not one for making a side project just to stay busy, because that just is, a, you know, it's a mental deterrent, so... Yeah, so I, like to, I like to complain when I'm not touring. <laughs> what about you, with you, Lip? I love to tour. I'm, that's when I'm, I suppose I'm the most content and, and what I mean by content of course I'm always anxious I mean you can, that comes across in the movie I'm sure that you saw that always anxious so for those of New Zealand that are uh, or even just generally in the world listening to this interview that are not quite uh, I guess up to speed so to speak with the um, with, with Anvil uh, let's let's go back to the beginning let's talk about the beginning uh, how did the first sort of assemblage of this the band start where did it all begin guys you know we were kids man when we started because i mean you know the, we met at a jam at a buddy's uh, mutual friends uh, jam the yeah. decision yeah. after the jam that we were gonna that we were gonna put a band together as time went on we just said we're gonna do this forever we found what we wanted to do and and we stuck with it we stuck with it and we've made some fucking very serious music over the years. <laughs> so, um, in 19, uh, so Lips, this is a question for you. Uh, in 81, you released the album uh, Hard and Heavy, and following this release, you were actually asked by Lemmy Kilmeister of Motorhead to play guitar, uh, taking place of Fast Eddie Clark, but you declined. Why was that? Motorhead came to Toronto. They were playing in Toronto, Canada. And uh, Eddie Clark had a... I don't know, they, they got into a big argument backstage um, and basically he quit the band. And the next day we got a call from their management asking if I could come out and do the tour with them. And I was in the middle of, of writing and preparing for Forged in Fire at the time and under contract to a record company and in my own band and I said no. 
So let, let's talk about this album, um, Metal on Metal, which has influenced many notab- notable heavy metal groups, including the Big Four, and uh, even a lot of today's metal bands. So those that are listening to this interview now wanting to write an album that would hopefully to them be the next big thing what was your creative ro- uh, writing process that fueled the fire to write such a successful heavy metal album it was done out of pure innocence yeah you gotta do you gotta do it in the, in the sense that you're you're believing that you have something to offer um, that that is not the same as everybody else that is unique and we always felt that. I mean, we started at very young age and we acquired our own our own sound and eventually put the band that we now call Apple together and created uh, original music. And and it's precisely that. It's about it's a band or you're going to become a real band and try to make it. There's no real gray area. <laughs> so uh, at a very young age, we. Did, you know, you know it if you are one of those people that is going to do it for life because you're usually blessed with being able to write. There are some musicians that are blessed with being able to copy anything that's out there. And there are other musicians that don't really get off on copying. And all they do is start writing. And that's how they learn how to play, which is like me. I mean, that's basically how I learned how to play was by learning how to write I sort of did it at the same time I didn't I didn't I, I only had a, a certain number of of major influences that I got that I was inspired by but generally speaking it was all trial but trial and error learning how to play and learning how to write at the same time because I just figured my philosophy from from day one is if you're going to do this you got to write. What's the point in being in a band if you're not writing? You know, I was influenced. I was. I've been always playing drums. I learned from the uh, the great, the, the true greats, and there have never been anything as great as then. But uh, I've always believed that you got to have your own style and your own unique thing, and um, maybe you can have your influences mixed in there. But you, you really have to have your own voice and whatever it is, and that's what it's really about to be original you got to be unique and uh you you also released the the documentary the called anvil the story of anvil which has brought so many new fans especially here in new zealand uh with it such raw intense and brutally honest views did you expect this documentary to be as successful as it became yeah yeah lips did i, mean, I, I can ask a real it's a real a real simple simple deduction you know so you, you meet a, a, a you go, you go, and you meet a friend that you haven't seen in in twenty five years, who's become a, a screenwriter for Steven Spielberg, and he goes, "Hey, I'm going to make a movie about you. What do you think is going to happen?" <laughs> Sasha was actually a fan of yours as well. So, what did that mean to you having a fan coming up to you? And I, I understand, Lips, that you got quite emotional during that time when Sasha wanted to uh, do this movie with you guys. In in a split second, uh, thirty years of trials and tribulations were were immediately made valid. Right? They're gonna. I, I made I made in a certain sense musical history that's going to be made a, that was made into a film. You know, it's not it's not your typical story. This isn't this isn't a, a story about a band that failed. This is a story about a a great band that was failed by the music industry. That's a big difference. This is this is the and 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 so candidly uh, uh, displayed. It's not like it's fake. This stuff really happened, and we're we serve as the almighty prime example of the music industry screwing over musicians. So were you at any point worried about the, the movie becoming too dramatic or were you worried about certain scenes in the documentary? documentary? For example, uh, one particular scene that caught me was uh, when you were fighting to get paid after a certain gig um, that, you were, that you had played. Did you have any fear of trepidation at that point because of such scenes like that? 
No, actually, you know what? I after I mean, I was there through all the editing and and the entire process. Really, um, I didn't. The only my my only trepidation about something being shown was the was the naked picture. That was it. You know, it, it bothered me that they used the naked picture that, you know, Ross Helfen took in 1982 or 83, you know. But um, I was talked into the fact that, you know, the guy who's got to spend his life doing, you know, metal, he should have enough balls to let the world see him naked. So what? And uh, when you were actually um, filming, was there any point where you decided not to do any shooting during the film at all no 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 because we became quite a immune and not even paying attention to the cameras yeah you didn't even know they were there you couldn't really give a shit one way or the other because uh, two reasons you don't want to really you got to ignore it because at the end of the day, not everything was getting used anyway. They had like 320 hours footage. of footage for an 80-minute movie. So you knew that, so what, the cameras are going, who gives a shit? You know most of it's not getting used anyways. And, and even if it was being used, you would. we were assured by the director, who was a very close and trustworthy friend that if we didn't like it we wouldn't use it so we didn't really pay much attention to what was going on as far as when we were being photographed or or anything like that and there was never really any time that i said oh you can't film this i tried at one 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 place i tried and it was in i don't know it was in a show when i was outside and I was telling Rob that the place was packed inside. I didn't actually know I was being filmed. I had told the photographer to go away. I want to talk to Rob. And he filmed me from with a parabolic microphone from about 30 feet away, <laughs> that conversation. So um, in the end of the day, even when I did ask not to be filmed, it got filmed anyway. <coughs> And thank goodness, because it was sort of a good scene. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool, man. And how have things changed for you since, the, uh, for you since this documentary came out? Uh, do you guys still have a daytime job? I'm... Oh, absolutely not. No, that that's ended a couple of years ago, man. It, it changed everything. I mean, we've been, we've been, now we're in that play and tour and then record, play and tour and record, uh, cycle, like the good old days. And it's the best place in the world to be as a musician. That's when you write the best, that's when you are the best, that's when you really are on the top of your game. And that's what's, that's what's happened. You know, we've been out touring solidly, basically since 2008. And now we're in recording, you know, the second album since this is 13 we're at number 15 now so things are going well nicely and i think we're building the audience is is continuing to grow which is a, a an incredible thing wonderful thing and probably most important of all is that the young kids of today are recognizing anvil that's a big difference what, is that, what does that mean to you now that these well, younger generations are coming to you? Yeah, that's, our, that's, our, that's our whole future right there. So you guys keep you, you guys are planning to stick around for at least another 10 to 20 years when Metallica eventually dry out and there's no more Slayers and things like that? That, that sounds like a great plan. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, and, and it's not, it's not a, a competitive endeavor. It's artwork. And artwork is not about co competition. It's about it's about the people that that buy your your music. That's what it's about. Some you know some some bands are more popular than others. It doesn't mean they're better musicians. It doesn't mean it to, to each to each their own. To, uh, you know you ask an avid 
an avid Anvil fan about about Anvil, they're going to say that it's their favorite band, and no one no one out does it. So to them, we are number one. So to our fans, we know we are number one. And I'm a metalhead; have been my whole life. My favorite bands are never the bands that sell millions of records, anyway. So I don't look at that's why I don't look at it as you're going to replace this or replace that. No, we exist for those who love. To, to listen to Anvil at whatever level we sell. That's not really relevant. It's all about the music. For us in New Zealand that haven't seen Anvil live, let, let's, uh, I, let me um, quote to you on a quote that I found from a video of YouTube. I think it's something, uh, it's always good to think about whether you're going to be sleeping with the girl in the front row. If not, if not her, then maybe the girl in the th- uh, third row. Is that something you guys use while you're warming up to help you build up confidence for a show, or is it j- just typical anvil <laughs> stuff? That's that. That's that was that, pretty amusing. That's funny. That's a funny question. And these these days, uh, you know, what women? What what what, <laughs> what, what, what you know? What pussy? You know the you know the pussy that we find. You find them, uh, you know, in restaurants. <laughs> And banks, <laughs> grocery stores. <laughs> grocery stores are the best place, man. <laughs> so, so what do you guys actually do for a warm up before a live show? What are, we'll start with you, Rob. Is there any particular the techniques do you like to do? I know uh, Dave Lombardo likes to warm up or use ankle weights and things like that. Is, is that the same sort of scenario for you? Also Mr. warms up with a bag of green. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Reiner, Mr. Reiner just smokes a couple of nice cannons and just goes out and plays and lays the magic down. That's all. For warm-up, actually, I prepare. The only way that I really prepare is drinking a lot of water. You know, room temperature water. It's actually really important for, for, your, for, your, for two reasons. Age. Second reason, you have to, when you put a lot of water through your uh, larynx, it, they um, basically absorb it and it makes it way easier to sing. So do you still use your vibrator on stage instead of a pick now? Or? Well, I, <laughs> I use a pick still, but the vibrator does make its, make its uh, appearance once a night. That's cool. And now uh, we, we have a couple of uh, fan questions here, if that's all right. Um, the first one is from uh, Nikhil in Cambridge, New Zealand, and uh, he, wa- he wants to know what you think of recording uh, fully on analog on tape machine in 2012, or do you prefer digital now, or so you don't miss the rawness of the tape machine sound, etc.? Um, quick answer. Ultimately, there is... isn't nothing as good as digital to record with the process of digital recording is is you it, the advantages are insane um sound quality 100% control if you've got if you've got a producer <laughs> no need a producer you need a producer. You want to go digital, you better have a producer. Actually, you need a producer anyway. I, I mean, it's a lot more. Yeah, you need that a, other ear. Yeah, you can say, you know, all these all these uh, pseudo uh, smart guys, you know what I'm saying? They're going, yeah, analog is cool, man. It's the way to go. But when faced with what you actually have to be capable of, when you are recording analog, it's a completely different animal. If you're going in analog, you better be able to play every note perfectly as a musician, so that and and as a band, not piecing it together separately. That's what the difference is. When you do go digital, you can do everything a little bit at a time. You don't even have to. You don't, you barely even have to play. <laughs> in some cases, it's, 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 digital is a better process for you know uh, as a work as a work tool. That's probably what's better about it these days. We're analog, you know. They have to cut tape, and uh, yeah, you know, you have to bounce tracks, and it's just there's more tedious process. The sound difference is I don't know. It's arguable, you know. Some people say that the uh, old records sounded better. 
How do you feel now when you, I mean, I've been looking at uh, some interviews with you guys on uh, YouTube and um, I saw Lars Ulrich uh, even singing your praise now. How, how do you feel when you hear about stuff like that? Well, I feel the same way that Lemmy felt when I was singing in his ear. <laughs> you know, and you know what's really, this is a fascinating story. In 1983, I was on tour with Motorhead in the UK. And um, one, one of the nights we had a, a, a day off and I ended up uh, partying with Lemmy basically for 24 hours without even realizing it just because of drinking and you know, I'm with Lemmy, hanging out. <laughs> but it's interesting. In the conversations that we had, he told me that, you know, I mean, I was 25 and he was 35. You know, so he was, he had a, 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 a he had that older brother's insight. And I'm going, Lemmy, you're so unique. You're so special. You, 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 and he goes, really? That's amazing, man. Uh, thank you so much, Lips. And he's going, but you know what? He says, just know this and know it now. In 10 years, there's going to be someone saying this to you. And, and about 15 years later, I, I see Lemmy again and he pulls me aside. He goes, Lips, I want to ask you, did, you have, did, that, did that other musician ever come up to you and say, you're fucking great, you you know, all that stuff. And I go, yeah. And he goes, see, what did I tell you? I mean, Lemmy was, is a really, was, a, was, had a lot of wisdom and acted like an older brother in that, in that sense. It was interesting. So when you ask, how do, how do we feel when Lars speaks praise about Anvil? Much the same way. It's, it's absolutely, totally gratifying and, and, as a musician, fulfilling. It's it's an amazing feeling because ultimately, as musicians, what you're really trying to do is make an impression, be inspirational to other musicians, to give other musicians something. I mean, that, you want to be able to contribute. And when other musicians, uh, you know, enjoy what you do and are inspired by what you do, you've done the ultimate deed as a musician. That's what you're really, really trying to do. Change the world in a certain sense, the music world, and add something to it rather than just being tagging along and sucking money out of it. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, now, Rob uh, Lips, uh, when you look back on some of your tours over the last uh, couple of years, have you guys got any uh, anecdotes that you can tell the fans about? Any uh, funny moments? Funny moments. Funny moments? I don't know. What, you know <laughs> if people ask us that all the time. You know, we're, we're just a high power, kick ass band with a lot of entertainment uh, value. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the, the show. The, the, Lips, Lips I, actually talks to the audience. Yeah, it's I'm not I'm not I'm not talking at them. I'm talking to them. Um, it's 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 a warm feeling and a lot of fun. You don't you don't walk out of the Anvil show not having had a good time. We're about having a good time. What's one of the greatest compliments you've ever received from a fan, uh, guys? One each. Oh, well, that's well, that's. Thank you for the music. <laughs> How about that one? If I got paid a dollar for every time somebody's told me that, I'd be richer than fucking Paul McCartney. And uh, you have a quite a, a unique nickname. How did you get that? <laughs> That's got to be an interesting story or two. Well, well not, not that interesting. <laughs> not as interesting as, as, as the name sounds. But if you want to go with that, I'm, I'll, I'll, it's, I'll go with it. Um, it's, you know, it's a, it's a nickname that happened because I like to talk and, um, Rob's dad got a kick out of it and he started calling me lips. So that, that's how I got the name. It's just from being who I am. That's it. <laughs> it was very organic and, uh, very simple how it came about. I think we were standing. I got there. a big mouth. <laughs> I think we were standing in my uh, parents' house garage when when that was said. Yeah. 
And then it, it had all kinds of different permeations, like lipsomatic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when you look out, when you look back, like uh, over the last thirty years, um, did you ever expect that it would take this long to to make it so big, or is it because of that documentary? It's not even make it. It's all about we got to do this till we're old men. <laughs> That's what it was about. Make it or not. Making, hey, making it. Making it is a matter of perspective and how you want to perceive it. It, It's just as simple as that. To me, I've made it a long time ago in in the sense that I'm uh, making it was not having to play cover songs ever. To be able to put my own music out. To have my own fan base. And not just... Not just not just to say it, but to know that it's real and it, that it had longevity. That's success. So when you ask me, have I been successful? I've recorded 15 albums. I would say that's pretty successful. <laughs> so you guys are now working on a, a new album, which is titled Hope and Hell, uh, to be released in 2013. What can we expect from uh, this new endeavor musically from you guys? Is it going to be in the same sort of vein as Juggernaut, uh, Juggernaut of Justice, or is it going to be in a completely different um, approach to that? It's 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 just Anvil continuation, you know. It's 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 it's, it's, it's like Juggernaut, maybe, but more refined. In in since we've been trying to put our finger on that. You know, there's some cutting edge material on it. This record, like like, like there was last, the last one. one. Um, we just seem to feel it's the songs are just have a more catchier arrangemental format and uh, yeah you'll remember you remember you'll remember the the titles and the riffs um Um, uh, there's lots of monstrous guitar uh you know riffs on the whole record maybe that too it's it's got a lot of cool guitar riffs on it in in a nutshell it's more anvil being anvil (laughs) cool so let's talk about living the dream what does living the dream actually mean to you guys Living the dream is not having to have a day job and to be recording and writing music and playing tour all the time. That's living the dream. I completely second second that statement. That's cool, man. And uh, was there at any point during your career or even after the documentary came out that you had any fear that this could just all go away at any moment listen the reality is anyways once you're famous you're, you're famous <laughs> that, that that can't be taken away <laughs> from our perspective you know, here's a here's all... a here's a band that's been playing live for for decades okay the only reason it would go away is if we sucked live but we don't <laughs> it, in fact that's our that's our trump card that's that's the big one is the fact that we are an amazing band live. <laughs> cool. And that's what that's what made us famous to begin with. To begin with. That's cool. Some some individuals feel music in a special way that others just don't have that. You know, they can still play but they just don't capture that feel. I, I attribute it to the all the beautiful uh, pot I smoke. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, so on that note, I think that would be a good way to end the interview. So on that note, Rob Reiner and Lips Kudlow, thank you for joining us here on the Sick Room, guys. Uh, it's been an absolute blast having you guys on the show. And from New Zealand to you guys, we thank you for everything you've done for Heavy Metal. Okay, see, that's another dollar we could have earned. <laughs> <laughs> or how about earning another couple of dollars with a couple of different radio tags? Okay, let, okay. Let, let, let's let's get the, the now what 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 is is this called? Um, my radio show is called the Sick Room. Sick Room. Sick uh, Room. Sick Room sounds good. That's not, I like the sound of that. Oh, see, but see, uh, a guy like me finds that completely happening. I I could have a show called the Sick Room. Now you want us to mention your name in this? Uh, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, it, it's okay. Just say collab, and that's fine. <laughs> if, you, if you want. <laughs> okay, so. Are you ready for it? Yep, go for it. Hi, this is Lips. And this is Rob Reiner. We're from the band Anvil. You are listening to Sick Room with Collab. You know it. Cool. Great. Cheers for that, guys. Thanks for your support, brother. Thank you. Thank you. So, I mean, the, I mean, I'm glad that you guys have a connection with New Zealand now. That pretty much makes it everywhere in the world, I'm sure, now just about. 
<laughs> hey, listen, we're looking forward for, forward to the day that we really come there and rock. Believe believe us on that. I'd like to taste some good New Zealand green. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you guys uh, once again for this opportunity. It, may, it really means a lot to us uh, here at the sick room and to all, all from all of the Anvil fans. Thank you once again for everything, and we wish you nothing but the best on your uh, up, up and coming album and for your future endeavors. And we can't wait to see you guys soon. Okay. Okay, Caleb, you have a good day, man. Cool. Thanks, guys. It's, I'll talk to you guys soon. Okay, okay. Take care. Thanks. This Bye. is Lips. This is Rob Reiner. We are Anvil, and this is Sick Room with Caleb. You know it. Talking with this is 13. You're listening to the Sick